I love Bob Turley. He was one of the most special people in my life and one of the most special people in the life of A.O. Williams. You know, Bob was one of the, if not the most famous athlete in his era. Turley finishes a superlative job to play a part in each of these three Yankee victories in a row. In the early days of A.O. Williams, you know, there were seven RVPs. Bob was one of the original seven. At our first fast start school, we had 13 people, 13 people. We had more speakers than we had new recruits coming to the three-day fast start school. And I asked Bob at every fast start school to stand up and tell his story. And here was this giant, you know, this one of a kind in professional sports, you know, that would stand up there and say, I'd rather be an RVP in A.O. Williams than pitching the seventh game of the World Series for the New York Yankees. As Art Williams says, your life goes so fast, you're only here for just a little flicker. And what you do with your life is up to you as an individual. And I, and I think about everyone in this room stay, uh, sitting here today and thinking about A.O. Williams. You're either an old timer, you've been here a short time, or you're looking at this thing as a first time as a career. And I know the butterflies that are going through your, through your stomach like they were with Bob Turley. In 1948, I was just a 17-year-old kid, graduated from high school up here in East St. Louis, Illinois, and I signed a professional contract to play professional baseball. Well, can you imagine, 17 years of age, and I had graduated from high school, and I was to go play professional baseball the next day. I was scared to death. They gave me a grand total of a $200 a month. That's how much I got paid to play professional baseball. I loved it because I couldn't believe somebody would pay me money to do something that I so, so dearly loved. But I got on the mound that night, pitched the very day after I graduated from high school, and I was playing with guys that were 22, 23, 24 years, years of age. Some of them were coming down from the major leagues. Some of them were trying to go up to the major leagues. I grabbed that baseball and I threw it, threw it as hard as I could throw, strike one. And boy, my heart started to swell up, my pride started to swell up. I reared back and threw it a second time, strike two. I reared back the third time, strike three, the guy swung, and the first hitter I ever faced in professional baseball, I struck it out. I said, whoa, wait a minute, these guys ain't no different than the high school kids I played against. So I started in my career. Finished that year, next year, 1949, I went up to Aberdeen, South Dakota and played baseball. Went up there, scared to death again, went to spring training this time with over 500 athletes. And I had to make that ball club, scared to death, my whole career. But I grew into that again, ended my career up in 1949 in Aberdeen won every game that I pitched in, finished every game, had a fabulous record that never can be uh, uh, beaten, it can be tied, I was never taken out of a ball game. End of the year, I got called at the big leagues, I was 18 years of age. Can you imagine how scary I was? I had to pitch a ball game against the New York Yankees. Joe DiMaggio was the first hitter I faced. The first pitch I threw, and you can imagine, I was scared that I threw it right over the top of his head. <laughs> Joe went down flat. I reared back through the second pitch right down the heart of the plate, strike one. He just let it go by. I threw a curveball a second pitch, which was rare for me because I was known as Bullet Bob, and I threw a curveball over for a strike. I threw the third pitch, and it was real feebly a swing, and I struck Joe DiMaggio out. Man, was I pride. You know, as years went on, I got traded to New York. Uh, about five years later, and of course Joe DiMaggio became my teammate. And I walked up to him and I was going to rub it in. I said, Joe, you're the first guy facing the big leagues and struck out. He said, Bob, let me tell you something. He said, you were so damn wild, I wasn't going to swing at you and risk my career. <laughs> so he, he deflated my ego very fast. But you know, uh, I have so many fond memories of my life, and I only went to that story for just one simple thing. As you come into this company, you come in as a greenie, just like Bob Turley when he was 17 years of age. And it's going to overwhelm you, like Bob Miller mentioned to you earlier. It'll overwhelm you. And you'll say, gosh, I, I can never do what those guys can do. But give it time. Get in there. And you find all of a sudden you'll go from a sales leader to a district leader to a division leader. And don't skip those positions because they're important for you to learn every aspect of that because you're going to have to work with people in that capacity. 
But all of a sudden, when you reach the top, it's so simple. You see, it's so simple from my standpoint of where I stand up here tonight and this afternoon to speak to you. I, I, my head says, why can't you understand? Why can't you all be national sales directors tomorrow morning? But just like Bob Turley in baseball, it takes a time, ladies and gentlemen, to reach the top, to get up there. But the rewards, are they worth it? Yes. The rewards are so fantastic, it's unbelievable. Now, I'm not talking so much about the rewards of the money. I'm talking about the personal rewards and the gratification that you're going to get out of your life of helping other people, not just clients, agents, people who come to work and you change their life in so many different ways. I could tell you story after story of people in the Turley hierarchy that today are multimillionaires, successful, but I could also tell you about people that are making $25,000 a year that are so happy and so excited with their life. Give it a chance and let it grow. But again, what does A.O. Williams uh, mean to me? And Bob Miller asked me to tell this story, and I'll tell it with you. And this is the way I try to express to you the feeling that I had on this special night. In 1959, I had just completed a year of 1958 where I was the Cy Young Award winner in baseball. I was the most valuable player in a World Series. They gave me a brand new Corvette. I wish I would have kept it. It would be worth a lot of money today. But at the end of that year, they select 12 people to be picked for the Professional Athlete of the Year. This is an honor that's bestowed upon one athlete in the entire world, boxing, baseball, football, any place, any business you play, soccer, all those sports. There are 500 riders around the world to nominate these people. And I was one of the people that was selected for this honor. It took place in Rochester, New York. I went up to that affair. Uh, the Hickok Company is the company that put it on, and I'm talking about the S. Ray Hickok Award, the Professional Athlete of the Year. It's a belt that had a value of $10,000. That belt is on my wall at home, and today it's worth about $70,000. It's got three pounds of gold. It's got about eight carats of diamonds inside of ruby sapphires. It's got a, quite a few things, but the material value is not the meaning of this belt. And I walked up on that stage, and I had my tuxedo, and I was sitting there up on the stage. I had the greatest time of my life. I couldn't believe that Bob Turley out of East St. Louis, Illinois, with the education I had, why was I up there on the stage with all these guys? Listen to who I was competing against. Sitting on my left was a guy by the name of Wilt Chamberlain. You ever hear of that guy? I was looking at him. Sitting on his left was a guy by the name of Arnold Palmer. Sitting on his left was a guy by the name of Jersey Joe Walcott. Sitting on his left was a guy by the name of uh, Johnny Unitas. Carmen Pasilio. I don't know if you know those names, but those are some pretty good people to be in company with. And I'm looking at them and I'm having the greatest time of my life because I have two small sons and I'm getting autographs from my kids, from those people. <laughs> I'm sitting there up on the stage. I didn't think I had a Chinaman's chance, but it was fun. And all of a sudden, an announcement came out, and uh, Georgie Jessel was the MC. I don't know if you've ever heard of that name, Georgie Jessel, but he's uh, Mr. Toastmaster. And Georgie was doing the speaking, and all of a sudden, the spotlight would come up, similar like you have over here, and it'd say, the number fifth winner, and it was so-and-so. Then all of a sudden, the number fourth winner, and it was so-and-so. And I'm still looking around, and they haven't, haven't called my name, so I said, oh, I'm still a runner. Then all of a sudden they said the number third winner was so-and-so. All of a sudden I know I got a chance. And I tell you, I'm so scared and I'm so nervous. They never announce the second place person. Then they always say, and the winner of the S. Ray Hickok Award is Bob Turley. Can you know how I felt? That's the greatest feeling you can possibly ever imagine in your life. But ladies and gentlemen, I feel twice as good about A.O. Williams as I felt that night. This is the greatest company that you'll ever participate in or be part of. And you're going to have memories for the rest of your lives and you're not going to be here very long. But this is a company that has a heart and it will share with you many great things. You're going to have a lot of joys, a lot of sorrows. But you should never leave A.O. Williams thinking you're a failure because you didn't make the amount of money that you wanted to make. Because money is not the answer. It's a special feeling you'll get of people helping you.